Welcome to another episode of The, the Crafting Slab. Today we're going to be doing the story of Burke and Hare. And I'm going to be making a graveyard themed terrarium. Similar to this one, that, but uh, on a bigger scale. It's got a little abandoned grave in there. And uh, we're going to be making it spooky with a few ghosts and maybe some pumpkins. So let's get started. Yeah, let's do it. So first we're just going to go over what materials you need to make the terrarium. So you start off with uh, some stones and then you add some uh, charcoal. We've got powdered charcoal here, which is why I've got glass because it's pretty messy. Uh, but you can buy um, charcoal pellets that are probably less messy and it's activated charcoal that you need. And then you need some plants, some little succulents. So I've just got these from um, the local garden centre. Center, thank you, I forgot what they're called. <laughs> and then some moss, which we, which we picked up from the woods. And for the decorations, we've got some different things. So we've got some rocks that look like gravestones, but we've also made some bits out of clay as well. So you can use whatever's easiest for you if you find some rocks outside or if you'd rather make the bits in clay. So I've got a clay gravestone and to make it Halloween-y I've got a clay pumpkin and I've made a little clay ghost and Becky's made a little ghost out of some fabric that's covered in PVA glue and shaped to make it look like a ghost. Uh, and then for our for our container, we're using an old fish bowl. Obviously, you wouldn't put a fish in one of these these days, so it's no good for anything and other than using it for a terrarium. Um, and all of the materials, basically all of the materials we've collected. So the moss um, Danielle got from the woods outside her house, potting soil from the garden. You can buy terrarium soil, specialised terrarium soil, which has got pumice pieces in it, which helps with the drainage, and just stones from the garden. So it's pretty inexpensive way to make a nice decoration. Another option is um, on a smaller scale is the is you can use these uh, jars or what we did the mini terrarium is just like an old food pot an old spice jar yeah, or a baby wash, food jar and make sure you wash it out properly. Yeah. Right shall we get on with the case? Yeah let's start talking about the case. So um, I've put some stones in on already, just uh, so it's not being too noisy while Becky's uh, telling us about the case. So uh, should we carry on? Yeah, great. Uh, so in the 19th century, in the, uh, well, in the 17 and 1800s, there was a growing demand for human bodies for medical research and anatomical study. Medical school needed bodies for uh, dissection to train doctors, but the supply of legal corpses, who were usually people who died in prison or were executed, wasn't enough so body snatchers or resurrectionists or resurrection men began to raid cemeteries in the early hours of the mornings to seal fresh corpses the most infamous grave robbing robbers in the 19th century is said to have involved william burke and william hare and there are plenty of movies and tv shows that have been made about them however they never actually dug anyone up instead they turned to more nefarious methods to obtain corpses to sell um, they were both born in Ireland. William Burke was born in 19... 1792 uh, into a comfortable middle class life. He served in the British Army and married young, but soon deserted his wife to work on the Union Canal as a labourer. He then married again to a woman named Helen McDougall and moved to Tanners Close in Edinburgh to become a cobbler. He was well liked among his clients and was said to really enjoy his work and sang and danced to bring in customers and crack jokes. He was also, strangely, a very religious man and was rarely seen without his Bible. William Hare was born in Northern Ireland. However, we don't have a year of birth for him. Did you want to talk a bit about what you're doing with the plants? Yeah, so um, you might have noticed that I um, added some soil and then added the activated carbon bit. Um, I did that the wrong way around. Oh. But it's fine, it all goes in, and yeah. the, the purpose of the carbon is just to... Charcoal. Charcoal, sorry. <laughs> the purpose of the charcoal is to just stop it getting mouldy. So oh, okay, I didn't know that. I thought it was for drainage. And um, so I've done... I don't know how well you can see this if I tip it over. So I've done the layer of stones, and then I've done a layer of soil, and I've built it up at the back to make it into a bit of a hill. Great. So, uh, back to William Hare. He... 
was, it was said he was born between 1872 and 1804, but that's as much as we know. Um, he also worked on the Union Canal before moving to the same Tanner's Close in Edinburgh and lodging with a married couple. Uh, the, the gentleman was called Logue, and after he died, it's speculated that William Hare married his wife, Mary Laird, but there's no actual sources to say whether that really happened, um, although they did live as, as though they were married. Um, in 1827, William Hare spent time working on the harvest in Midlo Midlothian, where he met William Burke and his wife, Hel Helen McDougall, and they became very good friends. And later, Burke and McDougall moved into Hare's lodging house, where they got a reputation for hard drinking and rowdy behaviour, and later a worse reputation for doing even worse things. Um, in November 1827, another lodger in the boarding house died, and he owed four pounds in back rent, which was about 400 pounds today. Um, annoyed at the financial loss, Hare decided that he would sell the body to a local anatomist. So after Donald was placed into his coffin at the boarding house, Burke and Hare snuck back into the room, removed Donald, the lodger, and put him under the bed. They weighed down the coffin, and after dark, when the coffin had been collected, they took the body to anatomist Robert Knox, who paid them £7.10 shillings for the corpse. Wow, bargain. Which was about <laughs> £750 today. Oh, so really? He made back his money, and they split it. They split the rest of the money. Knox's assistant, assistant said he was... He was. He, they were sure he would. He was glad. He would be glad to see them again. This, uh, the next victims that they um, they sold were people that they actually murdered. So they murdered another lodger named Joseph in 1827. So they they got the taste of it. From yeah, the they money. got the taste of the selling. Yeah, and then decided and so to take mass into their own hands. Yeah, and it was the easiest way. Obviously, digging up a grave is a pretty difficult thing to do and they had a lot of um you know people who didn't have much family or friends people from all, all over the country and people who wouldn't be missed lodging with them so uh, the lodger named joseph was murdered as they thought that because he was ill at the time it would he was infectious and it would be bad for business so um william burke later confessed that Hare used a pillow to smother Joseph, while Burke laid across his body to restrict his movement, which is a pretty horrendous way to die, to be honest. Um, presumably, they used this method to make it look like a natural death, so that they could then sell the body afterwards. Um, they took it straight to Robert Knox, who this time paid them £10, or almost £1,000 for the body. So they were getting a real feel for it at this point. Um, after that, they murdered a traveling salesman uh, who was staying at the lodge and he fell ill with jaundice so again he was already ill uh, which maybe made it easier for them to to morally contend with since Burke was apparently a religious man um, but after that they murdered a salt seller a pensioner named Abigail Simpson who they took back to the lodging house in 1828 in February and plied her with alcohol before murdering her they put her in a tea chest and took her straight to Knox, who was reportedly so happy at the freshness of the corpse that he didn't ask any questions. So he obviously knew what was going on. You know, there's a good chance that they weren't that far away from him, so there's a good chance she was still warm. Um, in their next victim, was actually didn't take place in the lodging house. The murder didn't take place in the lodging house. It took place at um, William Burke's brother's house. He had met Mary Patterson and Janet Brown at a tavern, got them drunk and invited them back to the lodging house, but on the way back he'd stopped in with his brother. Did you want to talk a little bit about how you were splitting the plant? Yeah, so um, these plants, there's lots of little plants in the pot, so rather than just have a, a clump and putting it all in, I'm just trying to split them down while keeping the, some of the roots together, um, just to... Um, make it look a bit better inside the vase. Great. Right. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, back to William Burke. They took the, he took the William back to his brother's house and continued drinking. His brother left for work and after that, Burke's wife, Helen McDougall, interrupted them and accused Burke and the, one of the women of having an affair. His wife left to fetch hair and his wife, Margaret Laird, and Janet Brown later told police that she didn't know Burke was married and left his brother Constantine's house. 
And when she arrived back to ask about her friend, Mary Patterson, um, they said that she had been that she had run off with a travelling salesman, which she didn't believe, and she immediately knew something terrible had happened to her friend. Uh, Burke and Hare mer murdered Mary, I'm sorry, Mary Peterson at Burke's brother's house popped her straight into the tea chest, but not before Helen McDougall had stripped Mary's body of her skirt and petticoats to keep for herself. So she sounds like an absolutely lovely woman, spending time with these terrible people. Um, and <clears throat> later that year, in between April and May, they um, went back to murdering on their own premises. Obviously, <laughs> murdering people at other people's houses had aroused some suspicion. So they... Um, they had come into contact with a Mrs. Haldane and her daughter and again murdered them in exactly the same way, put, put them into tea chests, took them to um, Robert Knox. Again, he never asked any questions and the last few murders were committed by Bert alone um, without Hare's assistance. So even though he was the more religious one, he is obviously the one that's got more of a taste for things. Um, that brings their body count to seven, to six murders and seven illegally sold. And it, it just goes up from there. Another victim was Effie, a cinder gatherer, who um, is a, a person who basically get, gathers trash to, yeah. to sell. Okay. And she was known to Burke because he had bought, um, he had bought leather scraps off her when he was a cobbler. So he was getting much, much more brazen, getting, you know, murdering people who he knew and who were well known. And unfortunately, that is what got him caught. Um, so I've put in a, quite a few of the succulents and a couple of the headstones just to get an idea where I want them. And now I'm just um, getting the moss and pulling little bits apart and placing it in here. I'm using tweezers just to try and make it a little bit easier rather than my big fat fingers. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, got a bit lost there. But, um, saying about Burke being brazen, he actually uh, came across a woman who was drunk and was being helped back to her house by a constable. He obviously had seen dollar signs in his eyes and said to the constable that he would help her get back to her home and instead murdered her in a stable. So... Um, he sounds like a nice guy. Yeah, he? he sounds like a lovely guy. There was a, a woman and her grandson as well um, who he described, who Burke referred to as an old woman and her dumb boy, her grandson, which I thought initially displayed, showed that he was like displaying contempt for them, but I think it was more likely that the grandson was mute and couldn't speak. Oh, okay. So dumb would have meant unable oh, to speak yeah. at the time. Not that that excuses him saying it. So the murder of the old woman and his grandson, Burke had said in his confession that it was the murder that um, disturbed him the most because it was a child. Um, but there isn't actually informa any information on how old they were or, or even their names as far as I could see. When, he, when they took their bodies um, to Robert Knox, Hare's horse refused to pull them the whole way, meaning they had to pay a porter to take them the rest of the journey. And on returning... Hare took his anger out on the horse, the poor abused thing, and shot him dead in the yard. Oh, no. So, and then while Burke and McDougall were out of town, Hare sold another body and pocketed the money for himself. When Burke discovered this, there was a violent argument and Burke and McDougall moved out. You would hope that that's when the crime stopped. Yeah. But unfortunately, that's not the case, and the rift between them didn't last very long. And by October, when Hare was visiting, they, when Hare was visiting Burke and McDougall at their new home, they got drunk again and it resulted in the death of the Burke's washerwoman as well as one of McDougall's relatives. So they're, they're really getting brazen now. They, they don't care who they kill. Um, things began to unravel when Hare chose their next victim who was a well-known 18-year-old called James Wilson, um, known in the area as Daft Jamie, Daft Jamie. He had a limp due to a deformity of the feet and a learning disability, but he was well-liked and well-known um, he was sold to Knox the next day and some of his students recognised Jamie. So they told, so, but Rox, Knox obviously knew what was going on and he told them it wasn't possible, it definitely wasn't um, James Wilson 
And so he very quickly removed his head and his feet before dissecting him ahead of the other bodies. Oh, he's absolutely complicit in what's going on. The final victim, on, killed on the 31st of October 1828, very spooky date, was Margaret Doherty, or Doherty, a middle-aged Irish woman. Burke lured her to, the, to his new lodging house, claiming that his mother was also a Doherty, and the pair began drinking. At some point, Burke left Doherty and with his wife while he went out for more whiskey, but actually he, he went to get hair. Two other lodgers, Anne and James Gray, were an inconvenience to the men, so they paid them to stay at Hare's lodging house for the night, claiming that Doherty was a relative. I'm calling her Doherty, I don't know if it's pronounced Doherty. The drinking continued, by which time Margaret Laird had also joined in, um, but the Greys returned to collect some things for their children. And they said that by that time, everybody was completely drunk. They were all singing and dancing and they witnessed a, a um, disagreement between Burke and Hare. Once the Greys left, they murdered Do Doherty and put her in a pile of straw at the end of the bed. When the Greys came back the next day, Anne became suspicious when she wasn't allowed to collect her things. When they were left alone in the house in the early evening, the Greys searched the straw and found Doherty's body. On the way to the, alert the police, they ran into um, Burke's wife, Helen McDougall, who tried to bribe them with an offer of £10 a week, which they could obviously afford because of, of what great business they were doing, selling bodies, but they refused. So while the Braves reported the murder to the police, Burke and Hare removed the body and took it to Knox's surgery. So even, even though they knew they'd been found out, they knew that everything was over they were still desperate to make money off this person the police located Doherty's bloodstained clothing hidden under the bed and when they questioned Burke and his wife they claimed that Doherty had left the house but gave different times for their departure so they're obviously suspicious um, and they took them in for questioning early the following morning the police went to Knox's dissecting rooms and they found Doherty's body and the Greys were able to identify her as the woman they'd seen with Burke and Hare the night before. Uh, Mary Le Margaret Laird, William Hare, William Burke and Helen McDougall were all arrested the next day. Are you, are you placing the decorations? Yeah, so now I've, I've put the succulents in, I've put the moss in, and I'm just trying to work out the best place to put all the little decorations in. It's looking really good. So it, they can obviously be moved around. Yeah. So the last details that we have were um, that the, the trial of Burke and Hare captivated the public and the media. Both men quickly turned on each other, um, seeking to minimise their own involvement, and in Hare's case this worked. And Burke's confession was damning, as he stated that Hare had been an accomplice throughout. On Christmas Eve 1828, which was just under a year since they first sold the, their first body. Um, Burke was found guilty on the mur uh, of the murder of only three victims and subsequently sentenced to death by hanging. Hare, though, despite his involvement, was released as a witness for the prosecution in exchange for his testimony. Burke was executed in front of a large crowd in January 19, 1829. I keep saying 19. 1829, and his body was subject to pu public dissection. His skeleton is still on display at the Anatomical Museum of the Edinburgh Medical School. So it's possible to go and see the skeleton of a murderer really? if you can get in there. Um, but I don't think that's unusual for, for anatomical or medical schools to have famous skeletons because I know that um, the skeleton of Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man, is, is still at the London Medical School, I believe. But I don't think you can. I don't think it's on public display. The Birkenhead's first victim, Joseph, was smothered with a pillow. But their later murders were done with a hand over their nose and mouth. Burke was quite happy to talk about all of these the gruesome details. But to me, that the second method seems a lot crueler because you'd have to look at the person. They would have. To, they would have yeah. had to look the person in the eye, and the victim would have known exactly what was happening to them, especially the, the child which I yeah. found very difficult to read about. Um, obviously the case was really important in the, UK, in, in the UK as to changing laws. 
Robert Knox was never prosecuted for any of his involvement, but he was obviously not just complicit, he knew what was going on, and I find it very difficult to believe that he didn't encourage it to a certain degree. Um, but they had a profound impact on the public's perception, and it led to increased scrutiny and reforms in the medical community. So the Anatomy Act of 1832 allowed for the legal acquisition of unclaimed bodies, which reduced the demand for grave robbing and murder in the name of medical research. Birkenhair's gruesome crimes left a lasting legacy in popular culture. Um, they remain a chilling reminder of the dark things that people will do in the pursuit of money. Scary thought, right? It's a scary thought. Speaking so of... while they weren't grave robbers, we're still going to make a cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of scary things, <laughs> uh, this is, as you can see, the gloves were a good idea because I've made a big mess. But I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see this with the light. But uh, we've got succulents, we've got moss, we've got gravestones, pumpkins and ghosts. It's beautiful. And we also said what you could do is, um, if, if you wanted to put a lid on it and make it a closed terrarium, you could put a light on the inside of the lid and yeah. make it into a Halloween decoration. You can paint them, you could do some white dry brushing on the stones, make them look a bit older, yeah. add some cobwebs, add some branches. I mean, I absolutely love terrariums even without the graveyard theme, but yeah. it makes it pretty cool. <laughs> I think it Halloween. makes it better. Thank you for joining us for uh, to hear about the case of Burke and Hare. And maybe you can add the movie to your watch list for Halloween. Definitely. And this is the terrarium we made. I hope you can see it okay. So it's got succulents, the moss and the gravestones. I think it looks amazing. And like I say, like we say, you can seal it up if you want to. Um, once you, you just have to spray it, mist it with water every so often if you want to keep it open. Um, but or you can keep it, you can water it and then keep it closed like we've done with this one. If you can quite see it, but you can see it from the top. Um, and then you never have to water it, it creates yep. its sort of little, own little um, environment in there. So we've got a medium sized one and this is our little, tiny little one that we made, the little abandoned gravestone. And I think it turned out really well. Yeah, I love it. So thanks for joining us today and uh, join us again next time. See you then. Bye. Bye.